it is it is through the crucible of sacrifice that this change happens. And to me, one one of the best statements on change that I've heard, it's a very simple one. And it is um, a, a minister that you know very well, Francis Bergen, who stated it. It is not possible that I go back. I can't go back. And I can't stay here. So I'm going forward. Mm. And, and in a simple phrase, that's change. Hi, so we're here today with Jonathan Reedy, a good friend of ours, and today we're going to be talking about transformation in life as a way to peace. One of the greatest stories about collective change is the exodus from Egypt. The Passover is a story about where God transforms a nation of slaves into a nation of priests. The main purpose of this podcast is to have a conversation about how change is essential in the Christian calling and how it leads to individual and universal peace. So welcome to the podcast, Jonathan. Great to have you here. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be joining you. Thank you for the invitation. I know that you're speaking to us from Geneva, which is a place that you've just recently moved to. Yes. Uh, so uh, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of a, a, a turmoil, a tumultuous change time for me right now. Well, uh, uh, but yeah. uh, <laughs> not not a not a worse time than for uh, not not there is no better time than for us to be talking about this subject because there's uh, no leadership if it's not hands on uh, and if it's not built on experience. And I know that uh, you have managed learning and development in major companies for twenty years as a corporate trainer and coach, which I can imagine has been probably a fun twenty years. Uh, fun, fun is one of the things that I experienced along the way. A lot of lessons learned, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot to be learned when helping people learn. And uh, hopefully I've helped other people to learn at least as much as I've learned along the way. Yeah, I'm sure. And I know we're going to tap into some of that, that learning today and some of that experience. So we're looking forward to diving into some of these questions. Yeah, so... Great to have you on. And our first question is, so is change important in our Christian journey? And if so, why? Well, you know, when, when we speak about the Christian journey, we're speaking about conversion. That word means change. It is a calling to change. Um, Paul speaks about that kind of, of life so eloquently in Romans 7 and Romans 8. It is, um, there is nothing about the nature that God finds in us, which remains when, when Paul talks about that, uh, that ultimate transfiguration in Roman, in, sorry, in 1 Corinthians 15, where the seed doesn't resemble at all the plant that eventually grows in the spirit. So there is change in this physical life, and it is ultimately building towards this tremendous change, this true transformation in every form and every aspect um, in the ultimate realization of our salvation. So yes, change is the Christian life. Um, breaking it down though is probably, uh, uh, there, there's probably a lot for us to discuss when we look at this life here and now and what happens because Going back to Paul, you hear language like "I die daily." That's mm -hmm. not a that's not a change project. That is uh, that is fundamentally looking at every aspect of my choices and my motivations for those choices, and putting them out there for God to examine and for God to bring me to grow through and to transform. That is the deepest level of change that one could describe. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting way and, and great way of uh, putting it. And um, 
but that's not an easy task. I mean, uh, I think, as you said, breaking it down makes it a lot more uh, complex and, and, and complicated. Uh, and what do you think um, many Christians face in, in this change process? Because it, it requires, of course, we can only do it through the power of, of God and through the help of the Holy Spirit. But it, it uh, requires us to uh, require something from us as well, some form of action on our part. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there I, I think that there are some clear parallels with the kind of work that I help people do individually and collectively. Sometimes I'm working with a small team. Sometimes I'm working with organizations of thousands of people. Um, and in in that process. Yes, there are. Um, th there is no way to go through change passively, mm. right? As much as we might like to um, let others carry us through that process and 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 um, let others do the the work, whether someone is in a position of leadership or whether the person is in a position of management or in a position of of uh, being a doer, being an analyst or a frontline worker, that the process of change is not someone else's job. Mm. It's not something that I watch. It's not something that I simply read about and speak about. It is done. Change is something which when we try to break it down in companies, and I've just been involved with a significant transformation project of six months in one of the world's largest hotel groups. And those companies have been hit exceptionally hard during this period of the pandemic. And um, they've had to examine how do we do what we do and how do we manage through this very difficult period where they've lost billions of dollars in, the, in a publicly traded company and they're, they're, in, they're in crisis. The change that they're going through isn't a change that happens in the minds of a couple of people in the headquarters. It's not a change that happens in the project team that I was a part of. And so our challenge as leaders of the change was to be able to go to individuals wherever they were in the world and meet them where they are and then help them move to where they need to be. Mm. And I like that phrase to describe any kind of leadership, but it certainly is all the, 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 the message and change leadership. Meet people where they are and help them get where they need to be. I can't make them go there, mm. right? The old adage, you, you can lead a horse to water. I, I can't change someone. Mm. So the leadership challenge is looking at the person as they stand today, asking the question of what is it that they do know about their present situation that they do understand? What is it that they don't see, they don't understand? And then working with leaders around me, working with their colleagues, identify how is it that that person, and it's one person at a time, how is it that that person is gonna identify what part of this future state really excites them and then what are the steps that they take, what tools they need, what resources they need to get from that current state to that future state of change? Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and the transformation is complete. And that's change, you know, and, and might sound easy to explain in a few short sentences like that. But that is fundamentally what we're trying to do when we do change. And it's not far from what any leadership challenge is, quite mm -hmm. honestly. It's so interesting. I see so many parallels between the actual human process of going through that change and, and the change that God does in us, because that's exactly what God does. He meets us where we are in our broken state, and he moves us towards this ideal that we, that we should be striving towards. Yeah, I like to think of change in three simple words, head, heart, and hands. In Addressing a person on the level of their head, there has to be a clarity in the vision that they are moving towards. And what you're describing is what an exciting future someone has 
in the kingdom of God? What is the excitement that, that they can feel that's based on a clear vision of the future? Mm. And we know the scriptures which say people that lack that vision will perish because mm. that, that vision is necessary for anything on the heart and hands to follow. So I have to, as a leader, I have to be able to transmit a powerful, compelling vision. And it has to be clear in the language and the, the, the symbols and the, 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 the phrases and the, the contexts that that individual can understand. Sometimes God meets someone and he's using language that's appropriate to that person at that time. It's not the language that would work for me that wouldn't do push any button with me. And as a leader, a leader has to recognize that as much as we might say the golden rule is to do unto others what we would have done unto them. I actually coach managers, don't do unto people how you want done unto you, because the how is different for almost everybody based on their different learning style, their background, the diverse experiences that they're bringing into life and this role. I need to listen and I need to take a posture, which I think Moses did. If we look at that story of Moses, Moses, we're told in Numbers 12, was the meekest man ever. I feel he took a posture, which is the posture that allows a leader, while speaking to people about a clarity of vision, to take a posture that humbly approaches someone with an understanding that I, as a leader, am here to help that person from where, they're, where they are to where they need to go. And so that's the head part, is transmitting messages, communicating that clear, crystal, compelling vision. The heart is the motivation. And here you probably will know the reference to starting with why. Simon Sinek is, is famous now for having addressed this, what he called the golden circle. Address the why before anything else, because why I do something gets my heart engaged. Mm. I can be cold and calculating. I can see a vision. I can see where it is. I can, I can understand it. But if I don't actually care, if it doesn't light something in me, then I'm not going to be there. I'm, I'm not going to stay there. I'll probably give you some compliance, but I won't jump in wholeheartedly. And so the heart is that commitment and engagement. And then the third element, the hands, is everybody has to understand how doable it is. They have to know, I can do this. And so they need to see little steps half steps, quarter steps between where I am and where you're talking about. Early in a leader's career, very often leaders will get excited in talking about vision and they'll mind the engagement and, and the motivation, but they won't mind the practical stuff because leaders sometimes can get carried away with their version of where we're going. And in reality, we have to understand where they're coming from. And for me here, um, you know, we were talking in advance of, of this interview about where the Israelites were when they were in Egypt and where they were going to a promised land. And quite honestly, I don't think they knew what they were wishing for. It's interesting. I think they had this idea, but they didn't see the the in-between. <laughs> right. Maybe, maybe they didn't even see the why. You, you mentioned Moses and the Israelites, and I know that we've just had the Passover season where we focus and reflect on our, on our spiritual life and the idea of, of change. And, you know, there are important dynamics going on in the individual to be able to, 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 to absorb that change, internalize it, you know, in the head, in the heart, and then through their action in the hands. And so let's just, if we take a moment to just step in and dip in to this story that Tim referred to in the introduction, this really one of the greatest stories of collective change, this Exodus story, because maybe picking apart some of the things that were going on, the dynamics with this collective community that had known slavery for 430 years, and suddenly they were thrust out, vomited out of Egypt, beautiful liberation, brilliant, brilliant for them. And yet, 
they had to, they stepped into freedom. They, they stepped into this, this new status and they had to corporately, collectively and individually go through change, a change. And so let's just dip into this idea. Of, can we explore a little bit of uh, Israel's reaction to this newfound freedom, a freedom they simply had no mental map for, uh, n no understanding of, and uh, and for them, why there were maybe some challenges in their individual uh, process and story of change. Yes. I mean, even in the best changes, there is stress and there's trauma and there's shock and there's a certain degree of confusion, even in the best changes. You know, we talk about the scale of stress and people getting married experience quite a bit of stress and mm -hmm. their, the uncertainty. And so here, this moment of liberation that you're describing, I, I think that what is easy for any individual to do is to get the excitement about all the wishes, almost a, like a childlike view of, oh, I'm going to have an ice cream sundae with whipped cream, not thinking, well, if I eat so much of it, I'm going to get a tummy ache or, you know, I do need to eat decent meals too. There are responsibilities that come with freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom isn't a ticket to anarchy or to, to a, a life without bounds. The freedom was a was was a a freedom from a an enslaved state to a freedom to a committed state. What God brought them to in the covenant at Mount Sinai was a great commitment. And I don't think that they were necessarily as excited about that as the idea of, boy, I want the beatings to stop. I'd like to be out of the chains and the the drudgery yeah it's in this change in this newfound freedom you rightly pointed out that they were placed within a covenant that came with law and they of course had that freedom and they exercised that freedom in a particular way at the foot of mount sinai with with idolatry and, and orgies and yet God is saying, and this refers back to something you and, and Tim were just talking about earlier, the idea of change takes on responsibility, like you, you said, but it's an, it's an internal commitment. It's something you have to wake up to every day. It's a process. And it's, it's interesting when we think about Moses going and receiving the law on Sinai, it was not a law to constrain that freedom. It was to keep them within that freedom that they have experienced all kinds of mess and uh, idolatry and, and all kinds of paganism and, and wrong and false ideas about who and what God was. And actually this was a covenant to say, now remain within the freedom. But at the heart of this covenant, which was the law, was written into the law, personal responsibility, that actually they had to turn up each day, that this is something that each individual had to take responsibility for. It wasn't Moses or the 70 elders, or, or Joshua, or Caleb. It was, hey, these are the things that you need to do to remain free. Yes. You know, when, when, when uh, we help people in large companies, we help people make all kinds of personal transitions as well as these large corporate transformations. And uh, a lot of people get rosy eyed about the opportunity to relocate. So, you know, worked in a Swiss company recently, and they would relocate someone. Um, let's say they were originally based in Argentina and they were located to the Swiss Riviera, one of the most beautiful places in the world, uh, the head office of this company. And they're very excited about relocating and getting a, 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 the experience of living in the, in, the, in the midst of such a beautiful area in the Swiss Alps. And what people forget is when we leave a place that's familiar to us and we go to a place that's maybe a dream or an ambition or a goal, we sometimes forget something very basic, which is that we bring ourselves with us <laughs> and we bring, therefore, our baggage, right? So, you know, the, the, the phrase, again, I think there's some, some truisms in some of our adages, um, you know, you can take the boy out of the country, but you can't take the country out of the boy. I think what happened with Israel is 
they brought a lot of Egypt with them. And their starry-eyed view of somebody else solving all their problems didn't come to reality. They actually brought problems with them. They brought a mentality with them. And God was asking them for more than just a passive acquiescence. God was asking them to take a leap personally. And I don't see that individual, active, personal investment that was needed, except when you see individuals, you know, you see Joshua, or you see later in the story, Phineas, you do see some individuals with that initiative, with that spark, but those are exceptions. It's a lot of, uh, can we call it followership and not a lot of leadership? <laughs> yeah, I think you make such an interesting point because uh, as you mentioned, you can't uh, move somewhere else and think that you're that life is going to be perfect. I mean, you're bringing yourself with you and you're bringing your baggage with you. Uh, I mean, I can just speak from personal experience in my own life. Uh, in, in the change process I've gone through as a Christian, uh, many times, you know, when I was living a, a different life, it was hard to, uh, to know what to do in your situation. You may be fed up with your life, with your situation. Maybe, maybe it would be nicer just to move away, move away. But I got some great advice actually from my father who said, you know, you can't, you can't uh, take a vacation from yourself. You can't just mm -hmm. escape from your own problems. <laughs> yep. And uh, I think this is exactly what, what uh, Israel faced. Because I think many, when I hear many Christians talk about the sins Israel committed when they, when they left the desert. And it's very easy to read the Bible on surface value or read the book of Exodus on surface value and, and say, you know, the, the uh, Israel, Israelites, they, they complained and rebelled immediately and they, they began to worship other gods. Um, but they had a baggage with them. They had been living in, mm. in slavery for 400 mm. years. And that's not, some, that's not a change you just do overnight. So what, what challenges do you think Israel faced um, in their exodus, in their newfound freedom? Well, I think there are, there are many of them um, in the context that we're talking about. I, I think that it would be easy for them to be very passive and to think of themselves as victims of their circumstances. And they were delivered once right? Mm -hmm. Supernaturally, 10 plagues, and then the, um, uh, the, the opening of the Red Sea, those things were beyond them. Yeah. And so it would be very easy for them to think, oh, okay, so um, we're just going to walk on lily pads all the way to the promised land. <laughs> and uh, it didn't start to materialize that way. They actually, had, it, it began to encounter adversities, uh, water, food, um, the, 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 the circumstances in which they were camping or, or you know, living in, in encampments, it, it probably was not what they counted on. And then there was the call to step up. Individuals, were, it, God began to teach them principles and say, this is, this is how you live and this is what you do under certain circumstances. This is you know, family living. This is living within your community. This is how you treat others. This is how you behave yourself. And I think that that passivity uh, versus uh, in initiative is a huge aspect of what was going on there. And another is the time. You know, the, people like, we, I think we all like to think that, you know, I can visualize this all getting resolved within a reasonable period of time. I'll give Moses or God, whatever might be going through their mind, I'll give him a month. I, I think within a month, we, we could easily get across this, uh, this desert and get into that promised land. And in fact, that wasn't how long it took. And it wasn't God's intention originally. When we read the scriptures, it's clear that he was saying that they wouldn't be, have been prepared to actually move into that land and conquer it in the state that they were being of the, of the mind of a passive people. So he needed to prepare them and very often we enter into our trials like this. I think we, we think of, well, there is, there's some event, there's some turning point, and I just need to get through that, and, and then this will be resolved. Well, 
who was it? John Lennon, who said, life is what happens when you're trying to plan something else, or it's what happens in the meantime while you've got other plans, something to that effect. And, and our intention, and perhaps the Israelites' intention, is let's get this over as easily and as quickly as possible. And that's not the way that God builds things of quality. Mm. It's not the way God is building a temple now through a spiritual body in, in his church. It's not the way God worked in Israel. And he shows us that he had a plan. Not all of it was known in detail at the moment they left their, their, their um, slave camps, but they didn't have the trust and the confidence to say, however this plays out, I know, you know, if we read the stories of Hebrews 11, I know I don't even have to grab a hold of the physical promise. I believe my God will prevail and I'm putting myself in his hands. Hmm. To me, that's some of the stuff that I think was going on. I think their attitude towards leaders like Moses and Aaron also were enormously um, um, immature. They had immature expectations. Moses disappeared for, I don't know how long it was, because by the time he returns after 40 days, they'd already built a golden calf and they were celebrating. So it doesn't arise in one day that you make up your minds to build an idol and you start the festivities. So he's maybe gone for a month or less. And without a visual contact with that person, in spite of the fact that there's a mountain up there with smoke and fire on it, they somehow didn't hold the line. I find that remarkable that there was such a, such a childlike attitude that they needed minding. And when they didn't have that, they lost the plot. And I see a very different Israel on the end of their journeys when they're entering into the promised land, there's much less of a dependent or let's say codependent um, attitude towards Joshua and towards the leadership of that time. I think they were very much in a shattered, weak, um, victim kind of mindset when they started the journey. And God knew that and God wanted to get them built up, prepared and mature. And they didn't join in that program that God had for them. Mm. And, and as you just outlined, they, they had many challenges in, like you say, their embryonic uh, phase, their embryonic stage, multiple challenges. Even though there was a responsibility thrust upon them, uh, they had uh, dif difficulties in meeting that responsibility. But there was a responsibility thrust upon the leader. And I know that he, of course, brought in the 70 elders, but fundamentally he was the one had the can on his shoulders and he bore the crown and it was heavy and even in his um, embryonic stage as a kind of new national leader i mean he had of course spent 40 years you know in midian sent back really against his will uh, he really didn't want to do it said let my people go and he now found himself at the head of god's nation not just any nation god's nation and so not only did the people find challenges but moses himself as a leader and as many leaders as spiritual leaders today find themselves you know facing challenges when it comes to leading people. So just dipping into that, what kind of challenges, certainly in that embryonic stage, did Moses face? And maybe not just talking about the challenges, what were some of his responses to those challenges? I think it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful question, question and, and it, we can we go, go in so many directions, directions with it. I, I think, yeah, it, it's, it's a very interesting challenge, a set of challenges that Moses faced. I mean, there were significant challenges to him even being the leader. We see those arising with, um, for example, the Korah story, but even in his inner circle with, with Miriam and, and Aaron, um, not having the confidence to say, God can work through you in this way, um, in a special way. Um, Moses had the challenge of people who were, as we said, over-dependent on him. And why is that a leadership challenge? It's, it's for me, one of the most fascinating leadership challenges that I've observed and that I've coached. Um, in certain contexts where a leader has um, a very dependent team or company looking up to her or to, to him, that leader is very often put in a position where they have some difficult choices about taking prerogatives that you and I would never have been faced with, okay? So 
a CEO um, that I worked closely with some years ago, essentially in the company that he worked, he could do just about anything. And, you know, the, 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 the company gave him grounds to hire and fire as he wished, to restructure as he wished. The, 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 the way in which the company worked, he really had very limited accountabilities. He wasn't in a, a structure which was accountable to the markets. Um, so he, he really had an enormous amount of prerogative. And I learned a lot being around him because I saw him making choices repeatedly not to take prerogatives that were given to him when a slavish um, public is, is, is uh, or, or, or let's say an employee base is, is ready to give that person almost the right to do anything that they want with the company. That, that, faces, that gives a leader a unique challenge of exercising the wisdom and humility to say, just because I can doesn't mean I will. And, and the contrary, the, 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 the um, opposite example is that of King Saul. He took prerogatives. Remember him taking the sacrifices and saying, but the people, they were going to leave if I didn't do this. He took prerogatives that he shouldn't have, and it cost him, it cost him dearly. He thought he could get away with it. He was king. And Moses had a meekness that did not take advantage of all those open doors and all those prerogatives. I have seen it with so many leaders. It's very tempting, given position and the positional power in hierarchies, to be able to do so many things at one's whim. It's an incredible challenge to have the meekness, the, um, the self-awareness to realize I don't have to do everything that I can do. I don't have to take advantage of every opportunity. Why don't I take this opportunity to pose some questions and find out, well, what's going on out there? What do we see with Moses? Moses listened to Jethro, who wasn't even in the camp of Israel, who wasn't even a part of the same group of people. He is the mother of, sorry, the, the, the father of the, the woman he married outside of Israel. And he gets counsel from this man, and it shapes a major part of his wow. governance and the structure he chooses because he listened to some feedback. A man says to him, you're taking all this responsibility, and it's not to the benefit of the people. You could do it a different way. And he had the wisdom to realize this isn't contrary to God's law, even though this man's not, I'm not accountable to him in any way. I don't have to listen to him. Why don't I take on what he's telling me? And Moses did. How, how he did that is amazing. And, and it's, it's maybe a little told story in that Exodus account. But to me, it's emblematic of the meekness that we read of when we know this man could, could hear what anybody said and he could take it on. And when complaints came and they came furiously and frequently, he actually was able to humbly, humbly respond to the people and say, please, you don't know what you're saying. Please, this is not against me. You're, you're, you're calling into question God's judgment and God's rules. I didn't set this up. Think again about what you're about to do. That showed again and again that meekness. And, and I refer to, to the model in Jim Collins' very famous book, Good to Great, I, there are some things that I, I've kept after all these years from that book, and one of them is what he calls this level five leadership. It's a combination of humility and determination. There must be an ability to know one's limits because no human being is smarter than the 30,000 people in one's company. And yet, when one makes a sets a goal and makes a commitment towards that goal, one will stay the course. And Moses showed both the humility and the absolute determination to follow God's direction. Both of those things together make this man this standout leader. I'm interested to hear that thought. I haven't heard it before expressed like that, that of course we know Moses was meek. Yes. And he was somebody who was willing to listen, as you said, um, listen to, to Jethro and take his advice. 
But pushing him into a potential of taking a prerogative that you just outlined are these people who are, as we've said, embryonic and just constantly looking, you know, so, so unable to take responsibility for their own actions and their own newborn freedom. They're constantly looking to Moses and there's this tension that Moses could very easily be the leader, which is the very much the lead from the front, make every decision which you just outlined, which is a challenge for some leaders. But he doesn't take that prerogative, that there's this tension between his meekness and then, okay, sometimes I have to step up to the plate. And, I, and it reminded me of, you have mentioned Jethro, where he listens and he takes Jethro's experience. He's not even part of the community. He demonstrates his meekness. But there is a wisdom in when he demonstrates his prerogative. And I'm reminded of the amazing scenario when God is so done with his rebellious new nation that you know he is now just liberated. That he says, no, Moses, no, no, Moses. I mean, talk about prerogative. I'm going to destroy these people and I'm going to start with you. And Moses could be like, yeah, God, I, about time. You know, I, I, you know, I'm done with these people too. And yet he takes a prerogative, but a prerogative in a really unique way. His prerogative is I'm on a level where I can speak to God and ask him to change his mind. So it's not a prerogative where he will lord it over the people. It's a prerogative which Tim has, has just referred to, this idea of servant leadership that no, 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 no. God, in your mercy, please spare this people because of your name's sake. And, and God relents. And so it's interesting that he, he takes the prerogative in wisdom in some circumstances, but meekness in others. And I think, you know, that's a, a, a yes. and maybe an incredible example of, of powerful leadership. I agree. I, I, you, you've hit the nail on the head there. Um, he, he was presented with the ultimate choice of prerogative. And he took great advantage of, of a good side of that prerogative, which is um, I speak face to face with God and I I can actually make a petition before God and God will will listen. Abraham had that rare, rare position as well. Um, I'm often fascinated at how Moses got there. And I don't know the whole story, but you know, we see him walking away from royal heritage in the first 40 years of his life and living a very humble life for the next 40 years in an anonymous situation. As a leader, one of the challenges that he had was he had never lived the slave life of the people he was asked to lead. So I believe reading what we read about him is he understood that that was something he needed to handle very carefully. Mm. Sometimes a leader can think, I know and I have this position so that, you know, I'm paid the big bucks, as they say, so that I can just make it happen for these people who need direction. In reality, I believe he, he realized that he did not understand what it meant to be a slave. He had never lived that life. And he could actually honestly say, I'm simply given an office by God and I will only go as far as God gives me to go with this office. And I won't go any further than what God wills. And he kept prostrating himself before God and saying, God, please guide us. Please direct us. Is this your will? He was really consistent in going to God and it was never about him. Now that is a rare leader. I've known very few leaders who could see I'm in an office God gives me that office and, you know, same is true in an organization, you know, physically I have position and it is not about me that I have that positional power, so to speak. Me as a person, I'm not, I'm not great. I'm, I'm not the one who earned that role and I won't take on the heirs of greatness that aren't mine. Uh, and I just want to want to comment on that. I think it's such a fascinating topic that you're bringing up, and, and uh, this concept it, it sounds very much like servant leadership, and, and that's a huge uh, concept in business. Uh, something I, I personally love, uh, and I often wonder. I mean, this must somehow originate in the Christian thought 
because it, it's such a wonderful thought that that the the leaders are actually the servants uh, and uh, I think the, the 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 examples you're drawing on here really really uh, emphasize that yes I think it does have its origins in, in uh, Christian thinking I, I if I remember correctly, there's there's uh, one of the early books written on it was in fact written by someone who was a, a self-proclaimed Christian. He, 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 it didn't come through directly in the writing of the novel that he wrote, but it came through in, in the um, in, in the epilogue or in some of the interviews. And it is the posture of Jesus Christ. It is the it is wrapping a towel around the waist and washing the feet of one's students. Uh, Peter Drucker said. If you don't understand that you work for the people that report to you, you know nothing about leadership. And that's entirely true. Um, we get used to the pyramids, we get used to the hierarchies, and people in positions of power. I've been close to those people. I've had some positional power given to me. There is just something that happens in human beings which becomes an, an enormous struggle with our sense of perception of ourselves and others. Um, and God knows that, and, um, and, and God needs, we need God to work with us, and, and God needs us to hear Him in those moments, and to respond and, and see Jesus Christ's example shining in our minds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you draw that uh, excellent example of, of Jesus washing the feet of His disciples. That was such a revolutionary thought, and it's, only, it's a unique account because it's only given in the Gospel of John, and it, it really shows the humble nature of God to wash the, the feet of, of the disciples, which was the lowest task of a, of a slave. And uh, so I see these parallels between, uh, between the liberation that Israel went through and the liberation that we experience uh, from uh, from sin on, on Passover with the sacrifice of Christ, uh, yeah. So, what what would you say are are the parallels here? Well, two of them really stand out for me. One is the finality. There was no going back. Right. <laughs> that if there was any chance of going back, it ended when the flood waves crashed and Pharaoh's army was 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 annihilated. There was the biggest closed door in Bible history right there. <laughs> um, it was a, a resounding finality. And that, to me, is one of the most encouraging messages about God saving us, is that which you put behind you after that Passover, after that baptismal commitment, it is as far from you as the East is from the West. It is never coming back to haunt you. It's not part of your story from here forward. And I think that finality is, is one of the most remarkable things. The other is what we alluded to earlier about the supernatural nature of it. God saved them. There was not a single one of them who could say, I contributed to this. I, I was really, I lashed together some wood and I made a raft and I got myself across that, that sea they had no hand in opening up that ocean and making a path and in, in, in setting back Pharaoh's army and then closing the waves and, and, and ending the story. That wasn't their self-salvation. That was a gift of God that they could not replicate and that they could never take credit for. And I think that is, those are resounding and powerful things that, you know, we look back sometimes at those stories and it's easy to, I mean, we've heard them for so long that it's easy for them to default sometimes into the realm of stories alone, and they are not. Mm -hmm. They are much more powerful. They are the epics of God working. Mm -hmm. And God being the same in all times means that those ways in which he delivered them are precisely how he delivers every human being in all times. It is powerful, it's miraculous, and it is as big an epic for one person to be given eternal life as it is for a nation to be freed from certain doom. And maybe there's one more piece that I would add, and that was choice. Because while it was God making it happen, they did have to walk. 
They didn't, they weren't carried by Eagles wings, meaning they had no part in it. They were carried miraculously, but there was individual election involved. And I think that that's something that, again, we see in our lives now. So Jonathan, you've just uh, talked about how the story of Israel, although it's a story connected to very specifically the identity of a ethnocentric community, i.e. the Israelites, that this is actually a story for all people. When he comes and saves us, when he meets us, you mentioned some of the things that he does. For example, he is the one who saves. He is the one who has to pull us out from the mess and the mire. We can't do that ourselves. But I know when we think about the Passover in Egypt and the New Testament Passover, there are maybe some symbolic differences. And I'd like to explore your thinking in that regard, because there's this concept, uh, maybe our listeners have heard it, a, a cultural web concept. When organizations are trying to instill a new culture, uh, a different way of thinking, a different way of doing things maybe, there's six uh, you know, themes or there's six components to what you would need to do to help move along culture, change it, give it its next iteration. And one of those is symbol. Of course, we at the ICFWP have our logo. You know, it's a, a man beating a sword into a plowshare. That is, of course, a symbol and very much at the heart of our organization. So how did symbol or how was symbol used in developing the community identity of the Israelites and the Christians? And, and how are those symbols different but yet complementary? Now, that, that's a very interesting um, aspect of this story. Um, you know, when we speak of change, um, change impacts on cultures. Um, and um, people sometimes have a view that culture, especially a company culture, they say, well, that's kind of a vague thing, isn't it? Culture, how do you define culture? What's a culture? Isn't it just kind of a an intangible, indefinable thing. And I don't, I don't see it that way. I don't actually view culture as intangible. I believe culture is made up of a million behaviors. It's how we do everything. The culture is, you know, in, in any given um, um, uh, culture, there are, there are ways in which we talk to one another. There are ways in which we address one another. There's an accepted norm around eye contact and the distance I have from you. Um, you know, entering into someone's home, I see they have different cultural ways of, um, do, do we take off our shoes before we walk into the house? Uh, is it expected that everyone joins the table when we have a meal? Or is it kind of, um, you know, just as and when? Th those are behavioral things. They're very tangible. Culture is composed of those things. Now, we may not in any given moment be able to detect what it is culturally that's different here from what I'm used to. We may not be able to put our finger on it, but we know there's something different when I'm in Tokyo than when I'm in Singapore. There's something going on that I'm experiencing differently. And so for me, when I look at what God asked of Israel in Egypt from the beginning, these great symbols, one of them was blood and blood remains a symbol in the New Testament, but very differently applied. The blood symbol given to the Israelites in Exodus 12, before they're delivered, at the very last plague, that symbol is externally applied. It is a message to a community around them saying, I'm with this way of life. I am trusting in a God who will send an angel over my house, passing over me, if I externalize that symbol of blood. And where is the blood in the New Testament symbol? The blood is in a cup and it is wine that is ingested. It's taken in and it is between me and God. And it is not an overt symbol. It's not phylacteries that are hanging down and displaying my um, let's say a proselytizing message that says you need to honor my religion. No, this is, I take this, I bring it in and it transforms me. And I am now under that Lord and master Jesus Christ in private and in public 
but it is a privately known commitment that many people wouldn't know seeing you pass on the street in London. Every Egyptian knew the doorposts of an Israelite on that night that God passed over them. And it was unavoidable who they were. They were making an external symbol. And there was a lot of that in the symbolism of Israel. That you, that, that, that you may be different, that you may be this special and peculiar people, known, seen externally and, and physically and tangibly as this people that does things differently. And God is asking for those symbols. You know, Jesus Christ brings the disciples into the upper chamber of an anonymous house. They couldn't identify it. They had to be led to it. Mm. And in private, these symbols are taken. It's not fanfare. It's not trumpets on the street. It's not in the temple. It's quiet, private, personal. It's, it's, it's a different kind of thing. It's not a corporate um, symbol. It is a very individual symbol. And to me, that is a, a powerful contrast in what God is doing and how he's doing his work in those two situations. Mm. That, that's, I had not considered that. You, you, one was a corporate symbol. One is actually a very private individual, epitomized by the fact that it was a private house, private room they were taken in. I had not considered that. And so God was really, I guess, with the uh, symbols of the New Testament Passover, the bread and the wine, was taking, of course, a familiarity, a connection, there's certainly a, a, a harmony with the blood of the Lamb. But he was saying, okay, this is, this is the, this is, first of all, I, I represent as Jesus, I am the blood, I am the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. But I'm going to raise these symbols to a higher level. And I'm just, I was just thinking as you were talking back to your previous comment, some people say, hey, culture drives behavior, and I think you're right, or does behavior drive culture? And there's probably a relationship between the, the two of them. But it's just so, if we take that idea of culture, you know, and of course symbol driving culture, well, the symbols of the New Testament are actually self-sacrificial. Look, I am giving my life for you. And it's in that symbol of the bread, the broken bread, because symbolizing the broken flesh of Jesus and the pouring out of his blood for the forgiveness or the remission of our sins. It, that symbol drives the behavior of the new covenant people. And, and how might that symbol drive the behavior? Why, why is that slightly different from driving the behavior of having, yes, the, the lamb of the blood sprinkled over the lentils of the door. Yes, God has set me apart. Yes, I'm a peculiar people, ethnocentric, you know, collective, but in the case of, of the New Testament, why would that symbol drive a certain different behavior? Mm. Well, Peter picks up on this, right? He actually says, to this you are called. Christ suffered as an example. His, his very clear message is, you're not called to a, 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 a freedom which means freedom from pain. You're not called to a freedom from um, from struggle and difficulty. You are called to suffer, and it is by that crucible of self-sacrifice that I will create this, this image of me in you. I will create the same life that is in Jesus Christ in you, and it will I will give birth to a, an eternal life from blood and flesh to to me it is it is a is a remarkable thing it is it is a great example to me there is continuity because one of my favorite chapters in the bible is actually leviticus 17 after the rituals of atonement are explained then god spends time explaining that without shedding of blood there can be no covering of sin there is no atoning and to me this is this is essentially the explanation for why Jesus had to die. There is blood needed to take away sin. And what is blood? The word that I like so much in Leviticus 17 is the recurring Hebrew word, nefesh, 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 nefesh. It's throughout that chapter. It is again and again drawing God drawing attention to you are... Nefesh, you're a living, breathing soul. You have an end. 
your blood drains out or you stop breathing and it's over. The blood, therefore, is the life thereof. And blood has some special quality for physical life. And then he, in the, the revelation of Jesus Christ's sacrifice, shows that blood has this amazing power to take care of all of the physical blood guiltiness and make it possible to have eternal life, mm -hmm. to liberate us ultimately from the nefesh. To me, that is a remarkable thing. It is, it is something that is one of those messages of the Bible, which takes some study to find. And yet it is, it is the central message in salvation, which is Jesus Christ's blood is the ultimate key in putting an end to the, um, the, 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 the human existence, which is fraught with pain, with suffering, and with grief. And it is by all of that pain and suffering and grief, the ability to, to cry, the ability to bleed, the ability to hurt, that God forms some beautiful crystalline character that then has his image for eternity. I, that's the story. That is the story, isn't it? That That is just so, so amazing, the point you're, you're bringing out here. And just to draw it back to our original conversation about change, yeah. because what you're talking yeah. about now is that that Jesus' sacrifice and sacrifice yeah. uh, is essential to change. And basically, the, the sacrifice that Jesus has given to us on the cross is really the, the ultimate change, the ultimate transformation that is necessary for us to leave our old lives behind. And this is, I think there are some practical levels to this, and I would love to get your thoughts on that as well. Uh, because really, when we... Uh, when we change, a part of us dies. Yeah. A part of us, part of our consciousness has to die. Psychologist uh, Jordan B. Peterson often uses this example that when we're in dialogue and, and when, we're, when we're correcting one another's thoughts, a part of me, a part of my consciousness has to die and be corrected. And really what Jesus did it, through his death is he enabled the ultimate transformation. Yes. Yeah, that's... that's there, there is there is a lot to be said there. It is it is through the crucible of sacrifice that this change happens. And to me, one one of the best statements on change that I've heard. It, it's a very simple one, and it is um, a, a minister that you know very well, Francis Bergen, who stated it. It is not possible that I go back. I can't go back. And I can't stay here. So I'm going forward. Mm -hmm. and, and in a simple phrase, that's change. And Jesus Christ didn't, you know, he, he didn't, he didn't rehash the past. He didn't say, oh, it was all a mistake. I didn't say that. He just said, here's the past. This has not meant salvation. This present, and he was brought into a present time that was that was fraught with 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 pain and with um, a, a a a form of enslavement, certainly a, a an oppression by Roman power. He met them in that circumstance. They had ambitions for him that were not correct. They had ambitions for him to do certain things that he was not going to do. And he said, I am going to build something. I'm going to build a body which will be a spiritual temple. And that change, he was right in the middle of this change between all things physical that were being focused on and all things spiritual. And here he was, begotten of God, so he was spirit, and he was flesh, begotten of Mary, and he's at this crux, this fulcrum of change between the way things were and the way that things will now be. And that, to me, shows this ultimate change. And it's no surprise that we don't read in the time that he's on earth before his death. We don't read of many people understanding really much of what he's saying, because he keeps saying, you must understand the son of man's got to die. 
you have to understand he's going to be raised up um, like that serpent in the wilderness. You must understand three days and three nights. And it was just kind of passing through their, their minds because that was too far for them from what they had known and what they were expecting. And he's saying, no, no, this is where I am working and where my father is working. We're working spiritually and it is, it is as sure as anything that human beings have ever thought physically is sure. It is more sure. It is the future for all of you. And although people did not get on that bandwagon so enthusiastically early on, you do see these messages. And Richard, you and I talked about this not too long ago, where at the end of John 6, after some very confusing statements by Jesus Christ, symbolic statements about his body and his blood, that a lot of people stopped following him. And he asked the disciples if they would stop as well. And they seemed to give an answer, which was, well, of course not. We're not exactly sure what you just said necessarily, but you alone have the words of spirit in life. Mm. And there is no reason for us to search for any wise man or any other words or any physical edifice. This is a spiritual thing that you've brought us to and there's no comparison. There's nothing else. Exactly. Those symbols of my body and my blood that he's of course referring to which we know were embodied in those Passover elements he's referring into John 6 uh, talking about his ultimate sacrifice Tim's just said hey this was the crux of the, the 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 fulcrum of change this is where you come to if you as a Christian want to experience peace this is where you start the 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 steps to change so you can experience peace. Peace I give to you, peace I leave with you. Not that the world gives, uh, but he's giving a different kind of peace. But it's the crux and the fulcrum in which elicits a new kind of change that was very different from maybe what the symbols of the um, Passover in Egypt gave. It was required of them that they love their neighbor as themselves. The symbols of the New Testament, the crux that we've heard and just talked about, actually elicits a new kind of behavior, a new culture, if you like, a new kingdom culture, which is love others as I have loved you. And this elicits a new change, a new transformation that is necessary for peace between yourself and God, peace between you and your neighbor. Yes. Yeah. So uh, you use the word crux. Yeah, I know. <laughs> you did too. <laughs> what? What what is what is a crux? Right? I know, I know. What is a crux? It, it, it it's it X marks the spot, right? Yeah. yeah. It, it's a it's a very interesting moment there in history, and it is it's sort of you know that that's a that's that's got to be on the map. We've got to understand that in order to understand everything that came before and everything that's going to follow, all the changes that happened there. I, I think I'm certainly still growing and understanding all those changes that happened there between. You know, the, the, the physical temple, which he knew was about to be destroyed and a spiritual temple, which he said, I will build. And he began to build so many changes and the symbols. Um, certainly some of the symbols just completely go away. Some of them he takes on and he embodies as a lamb. And some of them, he says, you've got to take them and they'll, they're, they're going to be taken in a different way now going forward. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot for us to continue to, to dig in and, and understand there. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So our final final question here uh, is we have a question about um, uh, Howard Gardner, professor of education and psychology at Harvard, Harvard University, argues that what makes a, a leader is the ability to tell a particular kind of story, one that explains ourselves to ourselves and gives power and resonance to a collective vision. Now, why is story so important? to organizational leadership and what is the collective vision for Christians? Well, I, I have to say, I, I really admire Howard Gardner. He's, um, he's had an impact on me in my, in my work, in my field for, for decades now. Um, I, to, to me, what he's starting to allude to there um, in part is again, meet them where they are, right? Mm -hmm. A story has to speak to someone. The term that we use, which may is, maybe has become a business buzz, buzzword, is relatable, right? The symbols that we read of in the, in the scriptures, 
they are easy to access. The way in which the story is told is easy for anybody to understand. It's, it's understandable at different levels because of its simplicity. And so in one's calling and early days of conversion, the stories that we read and the way in which we interpret the end can be different from the way in which we perceive them today after X number of decades, right? So we may perceive in a, a less mature way that God is telling a story which is centered on me and it's my salvation and I have an opportunity to live for eternity in the image of God and benefit from his ways. And what I've been talking about when I describe that story sounds a little bit like a child. A child, their, their, their ego is the center of their the stories. They picture themselves in the stories as the hero. They, they see themselves and they understand, I can experience something wonderful, magical, uh, a fairy tale. And, you know, I can be that that, that um, bold knight that goes and saves the, 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 the castle or saves the town. Um, I can be that lovely princess a girl may imagine that does this incredible act of, of grace and that allows you know, other people to, to admire her. But as we grow, if we're going back to this story of suffering, the theme of sacrifice what we start to realize as we move through our journey, the story, there are different colors that come out in the story. There are different qualities where we start to recognize um, this story certainly has a happy ending, yeah. but the route between here and the kingdom is not necessarily paved with gold. It's there that the streets are paved with gold, but here I keep stubbing my toe on some errant paving stones. I keep finding myself um, running into obstacles and, and, and finding in myself things that God tells me, that's you, Jonathan. That's, that's the person that I've called and that I'm transforming. And I didn't know that was me. He's acquainting me with things that are that that don't look like him, that that aren't happy for me to see, that aren't pleasant for me to see. And when I when I'm faced with those things, I mean, I'm I'm actually softening the message. We've trod on this road for a long time. Those those moments are painful moments. Coming to terms with things that are ugly, things that are negative, things that are selfish and vain, things that are the attention to the wrong aspects of my own life or the lives of others. And, and when we look at those things and we see them in ourselves, we are faced with not one change event, but a hundred thousand changes, right? Mm -hmm. Throughout any given day, throughout this day, I was faced with choices in how I was going to communicate to somebody in how I was going to respond when something happened. And not all those choices were played out in the same way the days before. So they were novel. And that change confronts me with new choices. And those choices confront me with myself in a new way. And so this aspect of storytelling where a person hears a story and the story, they have to see themselves. We can perceive it as a very egocentric story in which I'm the hero or we can perceive it as a story in which Jesus Christ is the hero. Jesus Christ is actually the savior. He is taking the, he's saving the days. He's, he's, he's taking the, um, um, all the negative, all the slings and arrows, all the attacks. And he is bringing us through that and making sure that good comes of this, that the ending is true. Now, the, 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 the collective vision that you talk about, what is this collective vision? Again, I think that sometimes we might have different views of that in different times. You know, I grew up hearing about the kingdom of God. What I chose to focus on was 
you know, there are these stories in Isaiah about a lion lying down with a lamb. And I would love to ride on the back of a lion and hold <laughs> on to the mane. And, and, and that somehow excited me as a six-year-old or a seven-year-old hearing that story. Passing but, people beating swords into plowshares. <laughs> right? But that's physical. That's a peaceful kingdom on earth. But actually, God has called us to a spiritual kingdom. And what we start to realize in Jesus Christ's words, where he says, I am working and my father and I are both working, makes us realize that he's called us to responsibilities. And in John, as parting words to his disciples, he says, I'm going to prepare jobs for you, places with responsibility. And I'll welcome you into those dwellings with responsibility. And you have to be ready for those. You have to live up to the standard that my father and I set in terms of, of sacrifice and work and giving of yourself. You're not being called because you're going to benefit from things and you're going to have all the riches and all the honors, you're being called because I care and I want others to care. I love in a way that you ought to love too. And I sacrifice so that others can live well. And I hope you capture that vision and get as excited about that as you might have gotten excited about what you're going to get, what you're going to benefit from, how it's going to feel, or what what you're going to uh, what 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 um, carnal perception of your uh, future state might have been. For me, the vision God reveals is one vision, which is this amazing kingdom of peace and a world tomorrow in which humanity live a, a way of peace that today we don't know, right? To quote Isaiah 59. The way in which we perceive that vision is similar to the way in which people passing through change perceive a change vision. We often have to tell people in the early stages of change, there's a great deal of denial, just as there is in a process of grief, um, in, in a, a mourning and a loss of, of a loved one. In that first stage of denial, the message about the change is almost universally misunderstood because it's landing on the ears of people for the first time. And they have only reference points from old maps. They only have the compass points that they came with. And so when someone comes and presents them with terra incognita, a world that they've never heard about, a world they've never seen, they take it in and put it on their old map. They try to put it in their old context. And there is this unwitting denial of the message or a warping of it and a changing of it. And it's not until someone's passing through the process of loss and of giving up things from those old points of the compass, those old reference points, that one can even start to understand the real vision and the ramifications of that vision. And then in giving things up, eventually reaching a point of saying, I'm stepping forward into something that feels very awkward and uncomfortable, very new and very unfamiliar. But I am going with confidence in a God who has kept his word and then starting to catch the vision. And then the vision, the picture starts to assemble itself little by little. I personally don't believe that the vision I heard of the kingdom of God was the vision that was being transmitted to my ears. The, the, I heard what I wanted to understand or what I was able to understand. And over the course of 50 years of living in this blessed calling, I've begun to understand the vision and begun to get more and more excited about it. 
and I feel like I'm gathering momentum in my excitement for that change and for the, 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 the future that God really has been telling me about all along that I wasn't quite ready, quite able to hear early on. So you've just commented on the kingdom story, this grand narrative that we're all a part of and how there is a, a gold paid city that we look to in the future, that we have our eyes set upon, not on the things below, but the things above, and that that is a, a time and a place in the future. And that, of course, fills our heart with hope. But in your comment, you, you mentioned John 14. I love this passage. Not only is it an incredibly encouraging passage, but I think it shares a little bit, or at least it, it indicates to us that although we are part of a story that's leading to an end, that, that that is not a point in the future that we just look to and then we abdicate all responsibility. You refer to Jesus saying, I go and prepare a place for you. And you then said, hey, this is about us being prepared, yes, for the future. But the preparation isn't in the future. The preparation is now. And so when we think about the, the story that you articulated that we're a part of this beautiful narrative that's not all about us and Jesus is the hero that even woven into that into our very each day daily woven into that is a sense of responsibility that we're part of this story every day although it has an absolute an absolute end and what does that mean for our, our daily uh, responsibility and our sense of waking up each morning and being filled with with meaning and purpose in the here and now not just looking to the future yeah uh, that, that, isn't that a remarkable thing? God's, God's vision, his, this exciting, inspiring vision that shines so brightly off in the future actually is not far from us. And what Jesus Christ is saying in, in just the minutes following those words is saying, I am going away and there is coming into you my spirit that will bring all of this about. So it's the, God is visionary and inspiring, but he's a practical God. And I like the way you're framing this because, yes, there is a story that is God's story. God is making this happen. He is the creator. Jesus is the savior. Together, they have made everything that makes this possible. We have a role and we join them and they give us all the strength and all the power and, and all the means to be able to achieve that. And you're right. It is a relatable story. It is a story that is in my day-to-day -day life. It is a, it's in every mundane aspect of my life. So it's not just something that on the weekend mm -hmm. I go into a church service and hear about, and maybe it twinkles in my heart for a little while and then it fades over time. No, it is something that I throw head, heart, and hands into morning, midday, and, and night. I'm always at that preparation work. And God says, you're a fellow worker with me. We're building and you're joining me in this work. Uh, to me, it's, it's both inspiring and very empowering. Yeah, I think that's a great place to end. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, it's been uh, wonderful talking to you. It's been been really fun. I've enjoyed it and very insightful. Uh, it's it's great to hear your experience, uh, both from your bi biblical literature, uh, literary knowledge, and, and also from your many years uh, of corporate experience uh, practicing the Christian life in, in a corporate environment, which is, it's been a real, real pleasure. And, and I really hope we can do this again sometime. Well, the pleasure has been mine. I, I, I learned a lot. I appreciate your questions. Very challenging, very, uh, very interesting questions. You like to make them reflect challenging. on and study. Appreciate that. It's, uh, it's been great. Really enjoyed the exchange and, and the learning. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan.